Welcome to the Red Sneaker Podcast, your guide to success in the worlds of writing and publishing. Now, here's your host, best-selling author and founder of the Red Sneaker Writers Center, William Bernhardt. Hello, Red Sneaker Writers. This is episode 35 going out on December 30, 2019. This podcast is for Red Sneaker Writers people who are serious about having a writing career and want some practical knowledge to help them do it. Guess what? This is the last podcast of 2019. And in honor of that fact, in the writing tips section, I'm going to do kind of a year-end roundup, what writers learned or should have learned in 2019. We're also going to have an interview with one of my favorite writers, Lauren Smith, I had a chance to work with Lauren many years ago, and since that time, she has become one of the most successful best-selling romance writers out there. I'm going to talk to her about romance and what works and how she built that huge legion of fans. But first, the news. This is the time of year when things usually quiet down somewhat in the publishing and book world, and this year is no exception, although there are still some stories and events out there worth taking note of. For instance, we have year-end sales reports, which are always interesting to writers who want to know what's going on out there. What am I writing? What should I be writing? Well, everything is pretty much as expected, pretty much trending as, you know, we thought it was going to be. Nonfiction is going, fiction a little bit less so, audiobooks soaring. But as far as where books are selling, uh, uh, the reports are showing that bookstore sales, and by that I mean brick and mortar, physical bookstore sales, are down considerably more than expected. There has been talk, of course, recently about Barnes & Noble maybe surviving under new management, a slight increase in independent bookstores, but that's not being realized in the sales figures. Now, books are still selling, but it's primarily online, and brick and mortar is showing some sales decrease. Another story, relating more to traditional publishing, has to do with Penguin Random House, which, of course, is one of the big five publishers. As you may know, historically, this A consolidated publisher came when the UK-owned Pearson Penguin Corporation merged or joined with, really, the German Bertelsmann-owned Random House Corporation to create Penguin Random House. Well, it's retaining that name, but apparently Random House has bought out the Penguin. (laughs) That is, Bertelsmann bought all the shares that Pearson had in the corporation, so now it's entirely owned by the Bertelsmann Corporation. Also worth noting for those of you who might be looking for a publisher, might be interested in traditional publishing, we tend to think about the these corporations, or people call them the big five New York publishers, but in fact, four of the five are foreign-owned. Yes, they've got offices in New York, but there is nothing American about them, with one exception. Speaking of Penguin Random House, its president gave a talk on trends that he saw in the past year and anticipates in the year to come. Here are the three most interesting takeaways from that. What does he see increasing, even more so, strong now and stronger in the future? Well, one was celebrity book clubs, one was graphic novels, and one was children's books. The graphic novels part is probably not a surprise to anybody who gets out and sees what's playing at the movies or on television or has seen how the graphic novels section uh, in bookstore, you know, once upon a time when I was young, you had to go to the back of the drugstore and find a cobweb enshrouded spinner rack to find any comic books, but now they are all over the place. Similarly, the part about celebrity book clubs is probably not a big surprise. What looks like is going to be the best-selling book of the year where the Crawdads Sang is a book that got its big break, first-time novel by a first-time novelist who is not young, I just have to point out. Uh, but it got its big break when it was the selection of the Reese Witherspoon Book Club. 
She seems to have the dominant book club right now, and her recommendation, plus a really good book, was enough to catapult this into stellar sales. Oprah's book club's influence seems to have diminished now that she doesn't have her own syndicated show, but Reese has a lot of fans. And the other one, children's book, probably not a surprise, especially since this list came from the president of Penguin Random House. Children's books are one of the few genres, if you will, forms of books where digital books have not made as much of an inroad as they have in other uh, other areas. There still seems to be a feeling with parents that they want a physical book, or perhaps it's their young children who want physical books they can hold in their hands at bedtime while daddy or mommy are reading them a story. I don't know if that'll last forever, but at least for now, from the standpoint of traditional publishing, who sees their future very much tied to print, children's books seem to be sort of a safe haven. One other thing I wanted to point out for those of you who are at the stage when you're promoting your books, BookBub, that's B-O-O-K-B-U-B, has got a new section on their web page called Book Promotion 101, which is really good, it, particularly if you're just starting to fig- uh, try to figure out how you're going to promote your books online. This is a very good primer on the subject, and it's completely free. Just go to the BookBub webpage and search for it, and you'll find it. And I'm sure while you're there, they'd love to sell you some advertising, which might be beneficial, but you don't have to do that. You can just go read Book Promotion 101. In this writing tips section, I wanted to talk about some of the top trends that we've seen as writers in 2019 and how I think they're going to play out in the year or years to come. I should point out that if you get the Red Sneaker newsletter, and if you don't, what's your problem? It's free. Go to my website and sign up. But anyway, if you get the newsletter, you've seen my top 10 list on things writers learned in 2019. And and the same article is posted on the blog on my webpage, williambernhardt.com. I'm not going to repeat the same points. But I am going to get into some of the key takeaways, starting with one. Amazon is not just important. Amazon is necessary. Maybe I shouldn't have to say this, but I do sometimes when I'm traveling at workshops and whatnot, hear people say, oh, I don't like Amazon. That's all corporate. They're destroying independent bookstores and, you know, yada, yada, yada. Look. I like independent bookstores, too. I like physical bookstores. Uh, I always make a point of listing IndieBound as a purchasing option when I send out those newsletters. But here's the reality. More than 50% of all books sold in the United States, print or ebook, are sold at Amazon. And if you're working in popular fiction, the percentage is probably even larger. There is no way to be a successful writer in today's world without having your books available at Amazon. So get over it. Support independent bookstores or whoever you want to, but make sure your books are at Amazon first and foremost. And please do not sign a contract with any small publisher who can't get your book in ebook format or can't get it for sale in any format on Amazon, that's going to be a losing situation from the get-go. Similarly, if you've got books out there and you're wishing them they'd sell a little better, Amazon advertising is absolutely necessary. This is the year when we saw Amazon ads going from being a nice alternative or option to being necessary. It's a pay-to-play environment right now. Sure, you can upload your books for free, but they're not going to sell unless you do some form of advertising. And Amazon's advertising system with its pay-per-click system is reasonably fair. And if you do it well and you choose the right keywords, then you can make it work for you. But something is going to be required to make your book break out can't assume people are going to find it on their own. They probably won't. 
And a lot of those internal features that Amazon used to have, people who bought this also bought that and whatnot, a lot of those have gone away because they're clearly trying to push people towards buying advertising. So if you're hoping your books would sell better, this is something you need to at least consider. And similarly, if you don't have an audiobook version of some book you've got the rights to, you need to get it out there. Audiobook sales are increasing dramatically every single year, and they're still increasing at a point where I would have thought, well, they can't increase by double-digit numbers anymore. They did, by huge, big double-digit numbers. People love audiobooks. That is vastly on the increase. You can create your own audiobook. Check out ACX. Check out Find Away Voices. There are a lot of ways to do it. You can do it. And again, if you don't do it, you're just cutting yourself out of a big part of the market. Have you written a series character? Have you thought about writing a series of some kind? It can be done in any field, not just mysteries and thrillers. It can work in romance. It can work in science fiction. It can even work in in westerns and horror and some completely mainstream series. But we're living in a world where now more than ever, series is king. There's good and bad aspects to that. A lot of publishers are pushing the writers to write more, 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 faster, faster. Quite the opposite of what publishers used to say. No, no, one book a year. More than that is, a, you know, you're a hack and it's a glut on the market. Now they'd be happy to put out a book, you know, every 10 minutes if you could generate one that quickly. Because once you've gotten somebody hooked in on your series or your series character, if you've done a good job, readers will want more. And here's the kicker. Some readers will not buy books in a series until it's complete. Something I had in mind when, for instance, I launched this Daniel Pike series and said, okay, six books. It's a six book series, not eight, not 14, not 47. It's six books. And then people who want to see the last installment (laughs) before they buy can get them all at once. And this is a series where every book stands alone on its, you know, tells its own tale. But there is a larger story that will play out over the course of six books. And and that's what makes it a series. Bear in mind, I started early, planned and had written a good deal of it before the first one came out. And that's what's made it possible for me to maintain a, what they call rapid release release schedule. If you can do that, it's great, but don't release a book before it's ready. That's the worst thing you can do to your career. I've seen people who have a book that's successful and then they think, oh, this is easy. I'll just crank them out. And they start putting them out too quickly. They don't take enough care. And that's a big mistake. As soon as a reader reads one book they don't like very much, you may be off their list and you will not get that reader back. So yes, think about series and think about committing to a solid release schedule, but don't ever agree to release a book faster than you can make it good. What's the secret here? Have a regular writing habit. Sign one of those contracts in the back of the Red Sneaker books. Make yourself write every day. Even if you think of yourself as a slow reader, writer rather, which I do, by the way, if you write every day, you'll get there. Even if you're a perfectionist, even if you tend to revise and revise and revise, as I do, still, if you just make yourself work every day, No excuses, no vacations, no, oh, I'm not in the mood. The muse isn't speaking to me. I've got writer's block or any of that stuff. Just make yourself sit down and do the work. That's how you generate books of quality that are still coming out regularly enough that people can get interested in them. And that's what you want. My very special guest for this podcast is Lauren Smith. I've had the pleasure of knowing Lauren for some time. In fact, I worked with her years ago when she attended one of my small group writing retreats. So really, I should take credit for all her success. But that would be a huge lie. 